Education, interaction, understanding. This is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to this last in our Reform Agenda series for 2012, uh, very generously hosted by Cause Chambers Westgarth. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, I know it's a busy time of year and that there are many other pressing engagements, so we really appreciate you taking an hour of your time on a, on a kind of cloudy Wednesday morning to come and engage in, in some debate about the kind of values and morality and philosophy that drives politics in Australia. It's a debate that we think is, is too limited at present. My name is David Hetherington. I, I know some of you, but not all of you. I'm the executive director of Per Capita. Uh, and as I said, this is the last in our Reform Agenda series for the year. Um, what we do in this series is ask leading political thinkers to cast their eyes over the horizon and to address issues of long-term importance to Australia, ideally beyond the current electoral cycle. Uh, most of these events focus on specific policy areas. So this year we've had uh, Penny Wong talking about taxation and public spending. We've had the Treasurer talking about long-term investment. We've had uh, Minister Shorten talking about the long-term reforms in the superannuation system. Today, though, we're going a little broader. Uh, and we're going to talk about political philosophy rather than a specific policy silo. There are two good reasons to do that. Uh, the first is that whatever the newspapers might tell us, there is more to life than interest rates, productivity, industrial relations, even asylum. And, and a good society and a, and a good, healthy um, civic society needs a, a conversation that is grounded in values when it comes to its politics. And I think in the mainstream debate, that's something that's pretty thin. Uh, the second reason that it matters is very particular to Australia in 2012, and, and maybe to Australia for the last kind of five or 10 years, which is, which is that our politicians have become increasingly removed from a discussion about, about values and, and morality and, and engage in, an, in a kind of day-to-day -day discussion that's more driven by news poll, uh, by focus groups, by the tactics of uh, the political uh, trenches. And that's a, an unhealthy thing over the long term. Um, we need to have politicians, I believe, who are capable of articulate discussions about social democracy, about liberalism, about conservatism. Um, if we don't, we end up with a politics that looks like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And I think you see increasingly signs of that. I think if you were particularly harsh, you could make an, an argument that uh, the centre-left in Australia has gravitated over time to the centre-right and so that you see the, the Labor Party enacting policy today, this year, that five or ten years ago they would have said was anathema. I think you know, the decision to excise the mainland from the definition of, of um, territorial Australia is an example of something like that. For that reason, it's terrific, I think, that we have some politicians coming through the ranks, like Andrew Lee. Uh, Andrew uh, was elected in 2010 uh, on the back of a stellar career in academia, um, one of Australia's youngest ever professors. He has a PhD from Harvard. Um, and he's embraced the, the grassroots part of his political career, I think, with gusto. If you look at his Twitter feeds, his email feed, he's always out and about doing the kind of grassroots community events. But in addition to that, he's willing to engage some of the bigger, more difficult discussions um, that, as I said, seem uh, sadly absent from, from Australian politics today. So we're, we're very lucky, I think, to have Andrew um, to come along and, and talk through these issues with us. I think, somewhat ironically, um, apropos of my, my observation that um, the centre-left has drifted towards the centre-right, I think Andrew is going to make an argument today that says um, that Labor should adopt more of the politics of liberalism. Um, which, which could echo some of that trend, but I'm sure he'll explain why it doesn't. Uh, the format for today is that Andrew's going to speak for 20, 25 minutes, and then uh, we're going to have a response from Dennis Glover, who many of you know. Dennis is a political columnist, a speechwriter, and happily for us, a fellow of Per Capita. Uh, after Dennis speaks, we'll have an opportunity for some Q&A with the audience, and then we might give Andrew the opportunity to make some concluding remarks. So enough from me. Uh, I'd like to ask you to welcome Andrew Lee up on stage and give him a, a generous hello. Well, 
Well, thanks very much, David, for uh, a much too generous introduction. Uh, can I, of course, acknowledge we're meeting today on the traditional lands of the Indigenous people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, you, of course, do me a great honour by being here at a morning event. I'm one of these people whose productivity steadily declines throughout the day. So, uh, so the thought that you've given up a chunk of your mornings uh, means to me uh, twice as much as it would if you were here for an evening speech. Uh, can I acknowledge Per Capita and David's leadership? Uh, per Capita really is a great Australian think tank. Uh, and it is increasingly, for me, becoming difficult to imagine uh, an Australian political landscape uh, without its voice uh, on important issues of uh, social tax policy uh, and those wider issues of uh, ethics and values. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, my friend Dennis Glover, uh, who I think in our 13 years of friendship has taught me more about philosophy and history uh, than he has himself forgotten in that time. Uh, and I suspect that uh, will continue to uh, teach me a, a great deal more uh, today. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, to thank uh, Cause for uh, hosting us here today. Uh, it's great to see uh, a Melbourne law firm uh, unabashed at uh, supporting a Labor politician in this way. So, uh, to begin. Exiled in the Polish town of Poronin in 1913, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin had plenty of time on his hands. Having already spent three years in a Siberian jail, he was biding his time to return to Russia. And so the man who would soon serve as Russia's first communist leader turned his attention to Australia. Like many around the world, Lenin was struck by the way that the ALP had swept its way into Parliament. Just a few months after the party formed in 1891, Labor won 36 out of 141 seats in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly. In 1899, Labor won government in Queensland. It lasted a week, but impressive nonetheless. And in our first national elections, Labor won 14 out of 75 seats in the House of Representatives. The next election, 1903, Labor's vote doubled. And by 1904, Chris Watson became Labor's first Prime Minister. Other parties of the time are struck by the strength of Labor's support, the energy and youth of its leaders. And yet Lenin was puzzled. In 1913, he wrote, you'll have to imagine a Russian accent going over this. <laughs> What sort of peculiar capitalist country is this, in which the workers' representatives predominate in the upper house and, until recently, did so in the lower house as well, and yet the capitalist system is in no danger? The Australian Labor Party does not even call itself a socialist party. Actually, it's a liberal bourgeois party, while the so-called liberals in Australia are really conservatives. The leaders of the Australian Labor Party are trade union officials, everywhere the most moderate and capital-serving element. And in Australia, altogether peaceful, I'm pretty sure he means that as an insult, <laughs> purely liberal. Naturally, says Lenin, when Australia is finally developed and consolidated as an independent capitalist state, the conditions of the workers will change, as also will the liberal Labor Party, which will make way for a Socialist Workers' Party. And you've got to say that Lenin's characterisation of the two major parties in Australia stands up better than most of his ideas. Unlike mo many other commentators, Lenin discerned that Labor wasn't solely driven by a belief in egalitarianism. Even in its early decades, the ALP was also a party of social liberalism. In his discussion of Labor, in fact, Lenin's only mistake was in assuming that the party wouldn't endure as it had begun. Now, fast forward a century and Labor finds itself in a spot of bother, as Winnie the Pooh might put it. In December 2007, a few months after Per Capita was formed, there were 445 ALP representatives across the nation's state, federal, and, national, and uh, territory parliaments. 
Today, there are 302. In less than five years, 143 Labor parliamentarians, one in three Labor representatives, have lost office. And at the same time, the Labor Party is shedding members. In the 1950s, more than one in a hundred Australian adults were members of the Labor Party. Now the figure is less than one in 300. And the trends common to other Australian political parties, at least the major ones, and to major political parties around the globe. Right across the developed world, mass parties are under threat. The Australian Labor Party is one of the world's oldest progressive parties, a term which I think per capita has done a great deal to grab back for the centre-left. And for us, a sense of realism about the challenge shouldn't dim diminish a sense of pride in what we've done. Through significant migrant inflows and strong economic growth, Australia has been able to undertake reforms like putting a price on carbon pollution and building a national disability insurance scheme. But we also have to recognise that parties need to renew. And for the Labor Party, I believe that that renewal might be found in an unlikely spot, becoming the party of egalitarianism and social liberalism. Liberalism means standing up for minority rights and recognising that open markets are fundamental to boosting prosperity. To borrow a phrase from George Megalogenis, Labor needs a commitment to markets and multiculturalism. In my first speech to Parliament, I argued that the Labor Party stands at the confluence of two powerful rivers in Australian politics. We believe in egalitarianism, that a child from Arakoon can become a High Court judge, and that a mine worker should get the same medical treatment as the mine owner. And we believe in liberalism, that governments have a role in protecting the rights of minorities, that freedom of speech applies for unpopular ideas as it does for popular ones, and that all of us stand equal beneath the Southern Cross. The modern Labor Party is the heir to the small L liberal tradition in Australia. Or, as my friend McGregor Duncan likes to put it, Labor is Australia's true Liberal Party. Alfred Deakin, great uh, Victorian, was one of the earliest Australian leaders to make the distinction between Liberals and Conservatives. Deakin argued that Liberalism meant the destruction of class privileges equality of political rights without reference to creed, and equality of legal rights without reference to wealth. Liberalism, Deakin said, meant a government that acted in the interests of the majority with particular regard to the poorest in the community. And Deakin's Australian version of liberalism drank deeply at the well of the British Liberal Party. In the late 19th century, Deakin's speeches frequently noted that the British Liberal Party was a positive force that sought to resist and overturn economic and class privileges across society. To Deakin, two of the British Liberals' greatest achievements were the legalisation of trade unions in 1871 and the removal of religious disabilities tests levelled against nonconformists and Roman Catholics. And as a member of Victoria's pre-Federation Parliament, Deakin began sketching out the parameters of Antipodean liberalism. Deakin was a great supporter of the anti-sweating league meetings, highlighting the exploitation of women's labour or sweating in that state's factories. Deakin introduced into Parliament the first Factory Act in Victoria, regulating hours and providing compensation for injury. And in his campaign for federation, Deakin helped the movement overcome setbacks and bypass the blockers. Of course, on race and on trade, Deakin's views were shaped by the time. He supported discriminatory migration policies and high tariff walls. When Deakin looked north from Australia, he saw only danger. 
When I read back through Deacon's writings, I find myself thinking, maybe naively, that if he'd better understood the role that openness can play in alleviating poverty, he might have been a Keating-esque internationalist who welcomed the Asian century. Given Deacon's extraordinary career, his sparkling writing, his strong political philosophy, it's actually surprisingly easy to amputate his more illiberal views. In the early years after Federation, it was conceivable that Deakin and his supporters might make common cause with the Labor Party. As Troy Bramston's pointed out, Deakin argued in 1903 that more than half of Labor's members would in fact be Liberal protectionists. In 1906, he said that Labor and the Liberals were united on seeking social justice. The only difference, he said, was that Labor wanted reform to proceed faster and further. And by contrast, Deakin regarded the anti-socialists and the hard conservatives as little more than wreckers brought together by what he called their attitude of denial and negation to progressive reform. When George Reid began to take his party down the anti-socialist route in the 1906 election, Deakin said that his platform amounted to nothing more than a necklace of negatives. A beautiful line that echoes down, down the decades, <laughs> even if it was a little exaggerated in the case of Reid. In another prescient speech, Deakin said the forces of conservatism were a party less easy to describe or define because, as a rule, it has no positive program of its own, adopting instead an attitude of denial and negation. This mixed body, he said, which may fairly be termed the party of anti-liberalism, justifies exi its existence not by proposing its own solution of problems, but by politically blocking all proposals of a progressive character and putting the brakes on those it cannot block. But with the conservative liberal fusion of 1909, Deakin's liberals finally made common cause with the conservatives. Much as he wanted, might have wanted to ally with the Labor Party, there wasn't much appetite for such an alliance in Labor ranks. And moreover, Deakin felt uncomfortable with the tightly binding pledge that Labor candidates were required to sign. It's a difference that seems trivial in an area where all political parties require their par parliamentary re representatives to implement their platforms. But it mattered then. In fact, if anyone needs further proof that the scales of history could have tipped the other way, you need only look to British politics after World War I, where the collapse of that country's Liberal Party led to a surge in support for British Labor. Troy Bramston calls fusion in Australia a marriage of convenience in order to counter and challenge the rise of Labor. But should it have been Labor at the altar? Since its founding in 1944, the Liberal Party of Australia has regarded itself as the rightful heir to Australian liberalism. Moving the creation of his party, Robert Menzies said, we took the name Liberal because we were determined to be a progressive party, a word they don't use much these days, willing to make experiments, in no sense reactionary, but believing in the individual, his rights and enterprise, and rejecting the socialist panacea. Robert Menzies never once used the word conservative to describe his party. And when in 1960, Friedrich Hayek wrote his famous essay, Why I Am Not a Conservative, my guess is that most in the Liberal Party would have agreed with him. But under the leadership of John Howard, liberalism ceased to be the raison d'etre of the Liberal Party. Instead, Howard announced that the Liberal Party was custodian of two traditions. As he put it, it is the custodian of the conservative tradition in Australian politics. It is also the custodian of the progressive liberal tradition in the Australian polity. John Howard, who had once said, I am the most conservative leader the Liberal Party has ever had, was breaking with his party's liberal past. 
As George Brandis has noted, Alfred Deakin, Robert Menzies, Harold Holt, John Gorton, Malcolm Fraser were all happy to describe themselves simply as Liberals. Howard was the first who didn't see himself and was uncomfortable to be seen purely in the Liberal tradition. Current Liberal leader Tony Abbott has taken the Liberal Party further down the Conservative road. He writes in his book Battle Lines, Liberal National might actually be a better description of the party's overall orientation than simply Liberal. A couple of years later, Abbott had watered down Liberalism further still. In 2010, nominating three instincts that animated the Liberal Party. Liberal, Conservative and Patriotic. It was a wonderful irony that Tony Abbott chose the Alfred Deakin lecture as the venue to declare that Liberalism's stake in the Liberal Party had been watered down from 100% to 33%. What's occurring today is the undoing of the fusion movement, the divorce of that marriage between Liberals and Conservatives. Small L Liberals like George Brandis, Malcolm Turnbull are distinctly in the minority. It's not much surprise that genuine Liberals like Malcolm Fraser and John Hewson spend more time criticising than praising the party they once led. As political commentator Peter Van Onselen argued recently, it's high time the Liberal Party changed its name to the Conservative Party. So where does that leave us? Well, a century on from the conservative liberal fusion, Deaconite liberalism is now back on the auction block. Increasingly, the Liberal Party is defined by what it stands against rather than what it stands for. The spirit of progressive liberalism, described by Deacon as liberal always, radical often and reactionary never, is in need of a new custodian. Labor has always contained a liberal strain, partly indebted to Chartist and Fabian traditions, but also influenced by the kind of social liberalism that Deakin and his followers advocated in the later 19th and earlier 20th centuries. And that fact wasn't lost on astute foreign observers, including Lenin. Australian philosopher Tim Sudmasophane argues that the social democracy of Anthony Crosland and Nugget Coombs owed more to liberalism than Marxism. He sums up his argument with the words, we're all liberals now, comrade. <laughs> and throughout the 20th century, social liberalism joins together many of Labor's great achievements. Broad-based income taxation under Curtin, a racial discrimination act under Whitlam, trade liberalisation and a floating dollar under Hawke, enterprise bargaining and native title under Keating, and into the 21st century, removal of much of the explicit discrimination against same-sex couples by Kevin Rudd, carbon pricing and disability reform under Prime Minister Gillard. So whether it's through support for individual liberties or the belief in open markets, Social liberalism has a prominent place in the story of the Australian Labor Party. And yet I think Labor's future is still up for grabs. The debate over the future of the British Labor Party has seen many in that party reject the economically liberal reforms of the Blair and Brown years. Labor leader Ed Miliband's engaged parliamentarian John Crudus to conduct the party's policy review. Crudder strikes beautifully about the party's proud traditions and he's spot on when he talks about the vacuous uh, polling gurus like Philip Gould, whose caricatures of Mondeo Man and Worcester Woman drew much more from advertising agencies than political philosophies. But I think Crudder throws away too much that's valuable. I've got to admit, my heart swells when he uses that great G.K. Chesterton line, tradition is the democracy of the dead. But in his yearning for Labor to reconnect with Britain's romantic and patriotic traditions, Crudus is too ready to discard market economics and social liberalism. 
Yes, British Labor had to renew itself after the Blair and Brown years. But I hope they don't make the same mistakes as Kim Beasley's opposition made in the late 1990s, when we distanced ourselves from many of the economic reforms of Hawke and Keating, when we advocated distinctly illiberal policies like scrapping the Productivity Commission. Labor will always be the party of egalitarianism. Too much inequality strains the social fabric, threatening to cleave us one from another. That belief of inequality is deeply rooted in Australian values. It underpins policies such as progressive income taxation, means-tested social spending, and a strong focus on the truly disadvantaged. That marks Labor apart from many in the coalition who maintain that inequality doesn't matter, that economic outcomes have more to do with effort than luck, and that government can't do much to reduce poverty. I'm currently writing a book on why inequality matters, an act that I expect might well see me expelled if I were a Liberal or a National Party MP. So we have the tradition of egalitarianism. But in also taking on the mantle of social liberalism, we'd be stating our commitment to open markets as the most effective way of generating wealth. That's not a theological belief. It's a practical one. It's grounded in centuries of human experience. Where markets improve well-being, we should use them. Where they don't, we shouldn't. To borrow a phrase from Harvard philosopher Michael Sandel, Ours is a commitment to a market economy, not a market society. In the realm of social policy, liberalism is the belief that tax cuts are preferable to middle class welfare. And it requires more of what FDR called bold, persistent experimentation. Australian policy could do with a few more randomised evaluations to better sort out what actually works and what merely sounds good. Many of Australia's greatest successes in fields such as farming, sport, medicine have been grounded in practical evalu experimentation and rigorous evaluation. I actually think there's something very Australian about the willingness to try new things, to honestly admit failure and to learn from our mistakes. And we could do with a touch more of this in politics. And that's because good policy evaluation isn't just a better feedback loop. It's fundamentally about a more modest approach to politics. As Judge Learned Hand once noted, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. And social liberalism also means an approach to politics which is at least as concerned about the nation's low entrepreneurship rates as the decline in manufacturing. One which permanently rejects impediments to international trade. A politics that acknowledges the power of market-based mechanisms to address environmental challenges, whether that's water buybacks in the Murray-Darling Basin or price on carbon pollution. A commitment to social liberalism would also pledge Labor to an open and multicultural Australia. Listening to the first speeches of Labor members, I sometimes wonder what my party's founders would have made of all the pans to multiculturalism and migration that seem to characterise almost every Labor maiden speech. Many of our founders regarded Asian, uh, people, people in Asia as the biggest threat to their living standards. But I think today social liberalism recognises Australia benefits from immigration, including from circular migration. I think it also acknowledges that national growth isn't like the Olympic medal tally. Prosperity in China, India, Indonesia boosts Australian living standards too. The modern Liberal Party is not the party of liberalism. Instead, it's the creature of Tony Abbott and his intellectual heir, uh, of John Howard and his intellectual heir, Tony Abbott. 
It is, as Tim Fisher once used to describe his favourite High Court judges, a party of capital C conservatism. And that, of course, leaves social liberalism free for just one party, the Labor Party. It's time for Labor to gra grasp this mantle with both hands, becoming the party not just of egalitarianism, but also of liberalism. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, uh, thanks, to, thanks to David um, for inviting me here to respond to Andrew, has been, who has been a, a colleague and a good friend since we both worked as opposition staffers together during the Beasley leadership days. Um, this is a great opportunity to engage in philosophical combat with Andy, who it is universally agreed is the sort of member the Labor Party needs and deserves more of. Um, the fact that one of the most switched on and best educated members of the caucus is also possibly the only one to have been elected in an open democratic ballot, untainted by factional manipulation, is a good advertisement for more Labor Party internal democracy. That said, I disagree with his idea that Labor should think of itself as an egalitarian-minded social liberal party. But the very fact of this debate happening in the party is a positive, a big positive. As Andrew's paper points out, Labor is in no small degree of electoral difficulty and needs to think long and hard about its future. You know, love him or hate him, and I'm in the sort of love camp, Senator Doug Cameron said something interesting at the conclusion of the disastrous 2010 election campaign. He said that in recent years, joining the Labor Party was a bit like volunteering for a frontal lobotomy. It has meant accepting the discipline of never thinking too deeply or too hard about Labor's purpose. I agree with Senator Cameron. With the advent of permanent campaigning and the need to stay on message for far too much of the time, we're inclined to accept too much discipline and shy away too readily from debates about the party's health and direction. So it's time to debate the big questions, and there's no bigger question to debate than what Labor's basic philosophy should be. Andrew's answer, as we've heard, is an egalitarian strain of social liberalism. He wants us to steal the mantle of small L deaconite liberalism from the big L Liberal Party of Australia, which he rightly points out should now more accurately be described as the capital C Conservative Party. Now, I have two major objections. The first objection is a reflex one. Asked to define the future of the Labor Party, Andrew's answer seems to be the past of the Liberal Party. And I suspect most Labor members would have an almost visceral reaction to that. And it's my guess that most would prefer the future Labor Party was built on distinctively Labor, not Liberal traditions. Saying that Labor should fight future elections not as the heirs of, social, of the social democratic tradition, but as the heirs of the Liberal tradition is a bit like saying we concede the war is lost, but we will continue to fight on anyway. Now, obviously, there is an important small L Liberal element in Labor philosophy. That has always been the case. We were never controlled by Marxists, as many European and Asian social democratic parties have been. We have always been firmly in the Western social democratic tradition. We were born out of the extension of the franchise to the working class and out of a desire to pull down the class barriers that prevented all individuals, regardless of their birth, from achieving their potential and enjoying the full scope of human happiness. We have never regarded individual freedom as being somehow opposed to the creation of a more just and equal society, although we have always put more faith in collective action and activist government than most Liberals would. The Whitlam government was the ultimate example of that, liberating individual talent through activist social policy. In my view, the Australian Labor Party is in essence not a Liberal Party, but a social democratic one. The word democratic encapsulates our Liberal tendencies well enough. There is no need to psychologically recast ourselves as another Liberal Party, even the tender-hearted egalitarian Liberal Party that Andrew would have us become. My second, my second objection is one of emphasis, particularly the overemphasis on economic reform implied by what Andrew proposes. 
As an economist, and a damn good one, Andrew's liberalism is driven partly by his strong belief in the power of the free market to create prosperity and higher living standards. It is also driven by his belief in the need for more market-based economic reform to increase national productivity and improve the efficiency, quality and efficacy of our social services and infrastructure. It has been a long time, though, since anyone could reasonably argue that Labor was anti-market. Labor has long accepted the market as the most effective means of generating wealth. But I believe that Andrew's position gives economic reform far too central a place in Labor's philosophy. In the 1980s and 90s, the Hawke and Keating governments enacted a number of big picture economic reforms. Those reforms worked. They modernised a creaking old economy in important ways. But since then, the generation that gave us those reforms, Hawke and Keating themselves, but also their former senior advisers and press gallery supporters, have raised those reforms to the status of an almost unquestionable Labor religion. They have managed to write the first and largely uncontested draft of the history of their era. The 80s and 90s are now widely regarded as the era of the economist as hero, the neoliberal reformer as revolutionary, the big picture man as patriot, the productivity ratio as the measure of national progress. So successful has been the crafting of this new narrative that it has, imprint, it has imprinted on the Labor psyche, the belief that only those who take up and carry forward the dropped banner of market liberal economic reform are worthy to be considered true national leaders. And I think Andrew's insistence that Labor must become a new free market deaconite liberal party places him firmly in that camp. The problem with that view is that, although economists tend to love the idea of reform and productivity before all else, Labor members and supporters tend to hate it. It has a moral flatness from which it is difficult to craft inspiring stories. If you're looking for an explanation for the fact that Labor supporters seem perennially uninspired, it's because our language is still too dominated by the rational statistical calculation of the era of economic reform. And this has produced a profound sense of loss of purpose amongst Labor's base. The answer to this isn't to dismiss the importance of the Hawke-Keating years or become hostile to productivity enhancing economic reform per se, but to put those years and that economic objective in their full historical and policy context. Placing economic reform too close to the heart of the Labor Party's philosophy violently confuses the party's ends and means. Economic reform is not our ends, it is our means. Economic reform is a policy tool for achieving our ends which are social democratic, not market liberal, and which are about creating a more equal society, not just an economically more efficient one. Must Labor reform the economy for the betterment of society? Yes, but does the Labor Party exist primarily, or even majorly, to enact free market economic reform? No. Equality, not economic reform, is the religion of the Labor Party. Human welfare, not productivity, should be its measure of success. Morality, not economics, should be its language. Social democracy, not liberalism, not even and Andrew's appealing social liberalism, should be its philosophy. Labor's future success, and potentially its survival as the dominant party of the left, lies not in giving yet more emphasis to the party's liberalism, but in rediscovering a moral and political language capable of appealing to a majority of its party members, supporters and voters. It will not find that language in liberalism. To find it, it has to go to the moral and political wellsprings of its own past. It has to rediscover its history, not just its history between 1983 and 1996, when it was the party of economic reform, but its history between the 1850s and 2012. As philosophers like Tony Jutt tell us, social democracy has been the great civilising force of the last century. It has blunted the creative destruction of community and family and solidarity that market liberalism has tried to impose. We should be looking to defend it and extend it, not back away from it, just to increase national productivity, especially not now. 
Our traditions and founding objectives are the things that inspire our supporters. At this point in, in history, when the excesses of liberal market capitalism have brought on a global economic crisis, it is not the right time to remake ourselves as a liberal party that puts even greater emphasis on the market as the saviour of the economy and society. Who knows what the future holds, holds but with the prospect, prospects for the world's economy looking so bleak, watering down our social democratic philosophy could be the worst possible historical mistake we could make at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, both Andrew and Dennis, for two very articulate, if competing, views on the direction of the left in Australia and, and the Australian Labor Party um, from its proud, long history, although somewhat contested history. Um, we've probably got 15 minutes or so for, for questions from the audience and for a discussion. Um, there is a, a roving microphone at the back, so if you'd like to put a question to, to one of our two speakers, um, please raise your hand. Um, there are a couple down the front. I'm going to abuse the privilege of the chair and just throw in one right at the beginning. And it's, to, uh, it's a question to Andrew about the implications of um, the adoption of liberalism for size of government. Um, often liberalism is, is something of a, a code word for small government politics. Um, that may be no bad thing, but it seems to run counter to some of the activist policies that the ALP is currently embracing in areas like uh, disability reform, carbon pricing. Uh, so I'd ask you, Andrew, what are the implications of uh, the adoption of liberalism for size of government, level of activism of government, um, particularly when we're at a point uh, where the federal government, at least, is at its smallest uh, in quite some time in terms of you know, tax take to, to GDP? Well, thanks, David. L let me, just before I answer that, uh, thank Dennis for doing me the great honour of an extremely incisive response. Uh, it's very, very easy to walk to a lectern and offer some pat phrases about what you think about uh, something. It's much, much harder to dive into the middle of, uh, of a piece of work and rip it to shreds. Uh, and <laughs> so <laughs> I very Sorry much thank, uh, th thank Dennis for, uh, for, for, for that. For that. Uh, in terms of size of government, I'm uh, agnostic on the ideal size of government and I don't think uh, a philosophy of liberalism necessarily gives you a particular answer, larger, larger or smaller. Um, the two examples you've given, David, I think are uh, excellent ones uh, in terms of uh, what I see as small L liberal reforms in carbon pricing and a national disability insurance scheme. Uh, involve small increases in the si size of government. Uh, I see that as consistent with liberalism. Uh, but I also take the view that government uh, should be no bigger than it needs to be. Uh, economists have this thing called the deadweight cost of taxation. Every time we raise $100 through taxation, uh, we destroy $20 of economic activity. And so we should always have that in the back of our minds as that there being a societal cost of raising revenue uh, and wanting to make sure that our programs all achieve their end uh, or it's better to return the money to, to taxpayers. So we've got a couple of questions down the front here. Um, I think the two gentlemen here uh, both had their hands up at the outset. Uh, uh, my name's Ken Kogel. My uh, comment firstly, I, I wouldn't want to see this reduced to a, a debate over what we mean by the term liberalism. And I think part of the problem with this debate is going to be the use of the word liberal because it, that will really sidetrack the debate into the sort of rejection of, of Andrew's ideas, whether on merit or otherwise, uh, simply because of their association with the Liberal Party of Australia. But my, my main concern is, is much greater than that. The context for our discussion today, in fact, is a global crisis, which is not the economic crisis, it's the environmental crisis, and we've got the discussions going on in Doha and the comments 
uh, yesterday by the Secretary General of the United Nations and whatever to remind us of that. And yet, Andrew, you made only fleeting reference to it, and Dennis, I don't think you made any comment at all about that context. Now, I think the evidence suggests to us that the ways in which we, as mankind, have to respond to that involves not only market solutions, but also what Tony Abbott calls direct action, but the sort of direct regulation which uh, we have been practising for decades, and uh, I, uh, no one is suggesting that that be abandoned. What I'd be interested in, Andrew, is if you can make some comments in that broader context about the global crisis which we are facing, which is much more serious than the, uh, the economic downturn. Ken, I think it's a great question in terms of the, the means we use to achieve environmental ends. And, and let me answer it with fleeting reference also to some of the things that Dennis was saying. Uh, it was striking to me last week when Parliament had to vote on whether or not to disallow the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, a plan which I think just takes a pretty practical approach to the Murray-Darling Basin problem, says that this is uh, a problem best solved largely through water buybacks uh, and uh, puts an extra three trillion litres of water back into the Murray. Who votes to disallow the plan? this motley collection of Liberals, Nationals and Greens. Uh, all of the Greens voted against it, some of the Libs, some of the Nats. And I think a, a distrust of markets there is, uh, is, is some, of, some of what's going on. So while I agree with you that markets are not always the best way of achieving environmental outcomes, I was at a Woodlands event with Tony Burke the uh, day before yesterday, and, and that's very much one that involves direct investment through community groups to expand uh, box gum grassy woodlands. There are also problems like uh, climate change and Murray-Darling, for which market solutions are practically the, be the best solution, uh, and therefore we should adopt them. And that's true even if we could build our party base some better using some other strategy. So I suspect if the Labor Party announced uh, that the way in which we were going to tackle climate change was to set up an Australian solar panel production industry with the aim of putting a solar panel onto the roof of, uh, of covering every Australian house in, uh, in solar panels, we're going to devote all our resources to this great nation-building effort of, uh, of panelling the roofs of the nation. Uh, that that might well engender an upswing in Labor Party membership and, uh, and a surge in, in enthusiasm among some supporters. But it wouldn't be very smart, and so I don't think we should do it. Uh, and that, that, I think, ought to always be our kind of guiding, guiding principle. Sometimes we have to articulate good, good policy rather than simply take the policy which is, uh, which is going to uh, affect our membership base. Dennis, did you want to put anything on the back of that? Uh, I'm not an, an economist, I'm an historian, and I, uh, taking the long view I, about the, how, the way that human societies change the way they think, I wonder if over the last, you know, since about the late 70s and early 80s, we've talked ourselves into thinking only in an economic frame, um, that, mar that the marketplace is the answer to all of our questions. I'm not convinced that, and, um, that the problem of global warming is going to be um, tackled successfully by an economist. I think it's probably going to be tackled by scientists inventing things like electric cars and more efficient solar power, etc., uh, etc. Et so um, th that's my thing. I I'm, I'm not against using the market here and there um, for things like climate change and other issues, but I wonder if somehow we've got them out of perspective, got that idea out of perspective, exaggerated um, what it can achieve, and um, should have a little more faith in the power of um, investment in science and other things to solve that problem. Okay, we've got three questions here, here and here. What we might do is take perhaps two at a time. I saw a fourth and fifth hand go. We might take two at a time and have you guys respond. So, mm. Jim. And my name's Jim Hyde. Um, I'm one of those former senior political advisors to the Hawke government that can't find a home. And, um, and I was so pleased to hear what Dennis had to say. Um, Andrew, I think that the, the problem with your analysis is one that I've argued with my friend also, McGregor Duncan, a number of times, and that is that it completely misunderstands the difference and the fundamental differences between equity and equality. And until the Labor Party re-embraces the notion of equity, 
and starts to really seriously address that, which is not going to do through markets, but is going to do through political philosophy and good evidence-informed policy, um, it, will, it will continue to fail. And I've been, since my, uh, since leaving the, the, the uh, offices of Parliament House in Canberra, I've turned myself into a career bureaucrat and I've had to fight what I call the hubris of the Carr and Brumby governments in accepting good policy. I've had Bob Carr tell me that I'm not allowed to use the words human rights in any policy at all because it um, led to a belief that lawyers would get hold of these rights and take the government to court. These, these were things like disability rights and, and so on and rights in healthcare. And I've had, um, I've had John Brumby tell me that a good evidence-informed policy which identified where there were large pockets of inequality which we could, we could invest in needed to have a, uh, a market response in terms of we'll put that out to, the words were, we'll put that out to tender. Well, putting things out to tender actually means the wealthiest and best informed and best written responses get the money and the investment, not where it's needed. And, uh, and it's a, you know, and to, those sorts of discussions can't be had as soon as, as soon as I would raise anything like that in a policy discussion. Jim, I would I'm going to have to draw you to a question in a, in a moment. Sorry, a, uh, a regulator. You're just a regulator. That would be all. That would be the put down response that I got. And uh, and it, really, I think the issue is how do we get equity back into the the political debate as opposed to equality, which is an entirely different thing. And it may be a, um, in my opinion, a uh, a road toward equity, but it's not the same thing, and we need to actually, I think, uh, resurrect a bit of political, de real political debate. Okay, we might go over there and just take a second question. Uh, thanks, Alison. Thanks, David. Um, uh, thank you, guys, for two fantastic speeches. I was left uh, in the situation of furiously agreeing with both of you, which is always uh, a challenging thing. Um, I was reading earlier this week some analysis of um, the election results in the United States where they were drilling down into some of the demographics behind the results and um, they had this terrific photograph of um, what I would call a uh, white guy from Ohio, tattoos, carrying the a baby into the polling booth, um, you know, cap, sunglasses, I think you can picture this guy, um, white middle America. And uh, after he'd voted, they asked him in an exit interview, who did you vote for? And he said, I voted for Obama. He said, because he's, he's doing a lot to save our jobs here in Ohio, particularly on auto, and I like what he's doing on gay rights. My brother's a homosexual, and I think he's <laughs> doing good things there. Now, this guy was a combination of social liberalism, but also market intervention, and I guess this question is probably more pointed towards you, Andrew. If you were advising uh, the Obama administration in the lead-up to their campaign, would you have said, let's pull support for the auto industry? <laughs> Good one. That'll put you on the spot. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> OK. Over to you two. Uh, so let me take uh, Jim's comment first. Uh, you're right that uh, our friend McGregor Duncan, also a friend of uh, Dennis's, uh, sort of looms a little over this discussion. He, my many conversations with Mac over the years have sort of informed my thinking on this. <coughs> uh, the, um, the equity equality distinction, I suspect when you talk about equity, Jim, you don't have in mind the stuff that Bill Gummo taught me at Sydney University Law School a couple of decades ago. You have in mind something around equal treatment rather than rather than equal rather than equal outcomes. Oh, so you have in mind what I would, might think of as equality of outcome as distinct from equality of opportunity. Yeah, I think it, I think outcomes are, are definitely important. Every claim I've seen around equality of opportunity tends to founder once you push people a little. So when you say equality of opportunity, how far are you willing to go back? How much are you willing to, uh, to, to equate? And in the end, outcomes matter because the world has a bit of luck in it. People founder on, uh, on bad luck uh, or receive inordinate good luck which we don't think they should be entitled to keep 
all the proceeds uh, proceeds of, um, and so uh, focusing on outcomes matters. And that's that's my general view on inequality. Um, and a final uh, point on that: um, Bob Carr seems to be shifting his view on human rights. I certainly saw him <laughs> uh, address a, uh, a human rights forum recently. So, uh, so good things come from uh, from making him foreign minister. Um, Nick, I think the uh, uh, I, I would th I think of the auto industry bailout as essentially fiscal stimulus uh, to smooth the U.S. through the cycle. I think it was one of the most efficient ways of. Uh, putting in place Keynesian pump priming. Um, long run, though, it's not obvious to me that the US is better off through massive industry subsidies to the sugar industry, which I think are, are larger still than, that, than those to the auto industry. Um, and so I, you know, I think there that's essentially just redistributing income from a large number of middle class taxpayers to a small number of uh, uh, US sugar, sugar farm owners. And the U.S. did their auto industry bailout in a pretty market-based way, and so you know they bought show, bought slices of companies. And uh, if you can do a bailout, that's not a bad way to do it. Okay. For, first to Jim, who I actually remember from um, advisory days back in the Hawke Keating era. Um, look, I think that the the response that I quoted from Dougie Cameron um, earlier um, provides some of the answer to what to what you're saying. Um, you know, we need to we need to have debate about um, what our beliefs are in order to open up the possibilities for, for, of, of, for the answers that we want to give. You know, I think over the last um, over the last few decades, there's been the people behind the, um, Hawke and Keating and the great economic reforms have been so overwhelmingly successful in in um, in selling the success of what they did that we it, we, we've become blinkered. We've been unable to think outside those the, the parameters that that debate has set for us. So I think just getting up here and saying things like, well, we need to think much more broadly than, about the Labor Party's um, direction than in economic term, than just in economic terms, um, enables, uh, opens up new frames, new possibilities of thinking things through that I think you can address um, some of the things you're talking about, Jim. Um, and, and with Nick, I think that that's a great example um, that you've given us, Nick. You know, I reckon that... Um, uh, progressive ideas are, are far more popular than we imagine. We all, we, we've fallen, we, again, a frame that we've accepted from the Conservatives is that, uh, is, is that, that blue-collar working-class guy from America um, is going to be um, a homophobe and um, is going to be a, a socially conservative Republican. And in fact, it's not the case. I know a lot of my working-class friends I talk to, they're all in favour of gay marriage and all these other things. We just I think we're a bit conservative sometimes in pushing our progressivism, if I can put it that way. Um, we should be a little bit more, um, have a little bit more courage in, in pushing the things um, that, that we believe. Um, so I think ultimately that the issue is about um, daring to think wider about such matters. Um, stop narrowing ourselves to think only in economic terms about productivity and um, economic reform and these things, think far more broadly because the Labor Party only became the party of uh, market-based economic reform you know, in, from about 1983-84 onwards. Before that, we believed in totally different things. Okay, so we've just got a couple of minutes until we wind up, so I'm only going to be able to take two more questions. There's a gentleman here in the middle and at the back, and if you could keep them short and sharp, please. Hello, I'm John Thompson. Um, I'm interested in um, the inequality issue and how in a field like education do you apply a reasonable liberal philosophy to that? I mean, we've seen charter schools and these sorts of things developing which really, which really um, haven't been successful and I'm not sure of a mark how we can rely on markets for things like addressing inequality. Thank you. And then final question from Joshua in the back over there. Um, uh, thank you both for your contribution. Um, 
I would challenge you both with being a bit uh, windscreen looking, rear view looking and historically focused. Um, the sweep of history you gave of the party and its philosophy started with an agrarian Australia, moved through an industrial Australia into the recent vacuousness of a consumer Australia. I'd like you to both look ahead to an information economy and without talking about that economy, talk about the moral and political challenges faced by that information economy and how the ALP needs to construct a, uh, an ideology and a philosophy that will address the future challenges posed by quite a different configuration of our economic activity. Andrew and Dennis, I'll ask you both to, mm. to take those questions and kind of incorporate any concluding thoughts sure. you might have. Sure. Um, on, the, on the question of markets and education, I think um, whilst probably the, uh, it, the introduction of markets to education has had some good in some areas, I think there's an overwhelming evidence that it's led to flight from public education and a lot of inequality and I'd like to see the Labor Party actually take on the private school lobby and pull back some of their funding, especially to the elite schools, and give, it to the, give that money to the public education system. Um, very difficult thing to do. The education lobby is incredibly powerful. We possibly lost the political battles on that you know, back in Mark Latham and Kim Beasley's time, um, but we probably need to show a bit more courage in getting back there. Um, and with regard to Josh, well, uh, your criticisms, are, are, I think, are probably justified in a lot of ways, Josh. But my, my belief is that uh, our, we have to start inspiring Labor people again. Um, Labor Party people are inspired not by the talk of markets and other things. They're inspired by the, great, the, the broad concept, broad philosophical concepts like equality, um, equity, um, uh, the idea of pulling together in time of crises, these sorts of things. I think they, we have to talk more. I'm not against talking about the future and looking at projecting um, our policies into the future, but I think that those broad philosophical points, those broad labour moral beliefs are the things that have to underpin um, any moves into the future that we take. I think once we jettison the idea of equality as our basic approach to, to um, labour's objectives, whether it's in an agrarian society or in a society based on um, the information economy and other things, I think that's where we're in trouble. That's where we stop inspiring people. That's where we start getting overtaken by the Greens and others, and that's where we're in real trouble. Wonderful pair of final questions. On John's question about markets, uh, I think uh, Dennis in some sense lost this debate earlier than he thinks he did uh, with the introduction of uh, Per funding that follows a child who goes to a non-government school. Uh, the Australian way of funding non-government schools is a US Republican's wet dream. When they talk about vouchers, they want what we have in Australia, uh, where funding follows the child. And the effect of that is you have a little more choice uh, for, uh, for, for parents uh, than you do in the United States, where you see low-income parents uh, having very few options uh, in, uh, in terms of education. Uh, I agree with Dennis that funding ought to be uh, needs-based and we need to do a much better job uh, through our, as we're doing hopefully through the job th response to the Gonski reforms uh, of making sure funding follows the child. I also think my school is important here in terms of uh, making sure that information isn't just held by insiders but that it is democratised, that everyone has the right to know how their local school is performing. Josh's question about uh, what Australia will look like in the future uh, is, uh, is one that, uh, that, that is a fascinating, a fascinating issue to ponder. We know three things. First, it'll be more ethnically diverse. Second, it'll be more affluent. Third, technology will play a much larger role. And so I think in that at atmosphere, uh, a Labor Party which is focused on liberalism uh, is actually one that's, uh, that's going to be uh, doing the right thing uh, in terms of uh, policy but also politically, uh, thinking, for example, uh, about uh, picking up seats like Wentworth, uh, which are, in my view, is a natural, natural seat uh, to be held uh, by a Labor Party committed to egalitarianism and social liberalism. Um, in closing, I, I've um, 
Very, very grateful to uh, to Sam again for, for Dennis. Sorry, he goes by Sam in, uh, in, in small circles, as as I go by Andy in uh, in small circles. <laughs> I uh, want to thank Dennis for a, a, a terrific range of comments. I think uh, his comment about market-based reforms going to Hawke and Keating, though, uh, misses some of the great, reform, great economic market-based reforms of previous Labor governments. John Edwards' biography of Curtin talks about Curtin's commitment to, mar to markets and a range of trade liberalisation and tax reform uh, put in place by Curtin. Whitlam cut tariffs. There's a range of uh, terrific, uh, terrific reforms on that uh, on that front. Um, uh, I think um, uh, Dennis is right that uh, uh, there are electoral challenges in a policy where you essentially say we're going to do what works. Uh, it's actually going to be pretty hard to go to the ballot box and say our policy is the stuff that works and we're going to experiment, we're going to try, we're going to throw away the ideas that, don't, that, uh, that fail. Um, but that's a pretty good strategy to be having, so I think we ought to be thinking about how to sell it rather than how to find a less effective policy that's more intuitively sale saleable. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, I had a sort of uh, slightly naughty thought uh, that maybe next time around when we try and push the uh, case for same-sex marriage, uh, and I'll acknowledge Melissa Park, one of my colleagues who's just walked in, uh, who, uh, like me, was a strong supporter of same-sex marriage when it came to the floor. We made a case for uh, from equality. We talked about marriage equality. Uh, I wonder whether maybe we should have drawn more on liberalism, uh, on the notion that liberty ought to entitle uh, two men or two women to get married if they so choose. Thank you, Andrew. This has been a, a great conversation. I hope, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, we need to wind it up there in the interest of time. Uh, and in doing that, I have one plug and a couple of thank yous to make. Uh, the plug is for a per capita paper on banking that was released earlier this week. Um, we've crunched a lot of numbers in the banking sector and, uh, and have made an argument that um, although they have the freedom to set their own rates, the banks are still too profitable given the risk uh, attached to their equity. And uh, we think a new public bank um, is one policy idea that has some merit that would be built on a common hub, perhaps underpinned by the RBA. Anyway, if you're interested in that, please download it and have a read and, and Twitter us or email us and let us know what you think. Finally, to some thank yous. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge CAUSE for their support, not only today but through the year for this series. Um, I think it speaks extremely highly um, to their quality as a corporate citizen that they are willing to host debates like this one um, that allow us to explore things as important as philosophy, morality, values in our society and our politics. And so I thank Tammy here uh, and her colleagues, John Denton, who's not here but has been a great supporter. Um, and I really want to put that on the record. Uh, I'd like to thank our two speakers, uh, Andrew and Dennis. Uh, we've got a little thank you here. Just um, what we needed. Yeah, Fantastic. just part of the season. Thank you guys. Um, a local drop. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, to see you through the festive thank season. Thank you very much. And lastly, and probably most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and for being uh, generous and giving supporters of per capita, not only today, but I, I suspect for, for some of you throughout this year and, and in previous years. Um, we wouldn't exist and we wouldn't be able to continue without an audience that finds our work and our platform engaging. So thank you to you for taking an hour on your Wednesday mornings, but also for your ongoing support. Cheers.